Hello, welcome to the first episode of the 2020 Big Douglas Birdcast. As I'm sitting here at home or in my home office, I'm sheltering in place, socially isolating, I thought it might be a fun idea to try and bring some weekly content to everybody that is interested in watching it, specifically around Minnesota birds and uh, migration as it happens. Uh, the hope, though, is that the content ages a little better than a rare bird report, so not necessarily something that has to be acted upon within hours or you know, days or whatever, but maybe perhaps we talk about that information and then we delve into how do we educate ourselves, how do we dig into resources on the web, and how do we just generally learn some new things. You know, maybe this is a great opportunity that uh, as we're sitting in our homes and we don't have a ton of things to do, maybe we can pick up some new tricks, some new things to help us uh, find more birds when we can get out more regularly, uh, and maybe some things you can do that are relatively near your home and you're able to go out and you know do something without interacting with too many other people uh, on it. So without further ado, we'll jump into a couple of different uh, segments. I'm hoping to keep these around 20 minutes in length, and uh, you know, if people enjoy them, I'll try and continue to do them and bring something on a weekly basis at the least and uh, just have some fun. So. so the first thing that I was interested in talking about are rare birds, because who doesn't love a rare bird? Certainly the you know desire for individuals to chase down rare birds differs by each individual, how much time you have and things of that sort. But uh, something that I wanted to do with this is take a look at those rare birds, but not necessarily only focus on, okay, what are the rare birds that popped up? I already scoured them for you, and here they are, and then, you know, move on from it. So what I want to do is to talk about resources. I want to talk about places where you can get these things. And now certainly rare bird reports can come through many different vectors. Certainly your own social network, the, the friends you might have, individuals that know you're interested in certain counties or locations or birds, they could notify you. We have things like the MOU listserv. So the Minnesota Ornithologist Union has uh, an old email system that's still in operation today that will email out to its membership base uh, reportings that uh, are put into it. And then when you look into more you know, current social technologies, there's multiple different Facebook groups that are targeting uh, very different uh, segmented audiences depending on your interests. And you know, there's a whole number of other ways. But this first one I want to look at is eBird itself. Uh, now, in a recent video, I did kind of a presentation on Beginner's Guide to Using the eBird app. This, however, when we're looking at the website itself, this is where it gets really exciting inside of eBird because they have exposed quite a number of things to the end user, and you don't even necessarily need to be logged on. But if you are, then you can delve into data that is your data and some other bits and pieces and stuff. But in this case, let's look at... Uh, rarities. Let's look at alerts, and it's actually right on the front page. So uh, when you come into the eBird.org website, and you've got this screen in front of you. We're currently in Explore. You can see it on the upper left. You'll see a, a bird icon for Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the eBird name, and then Submit and Explore. On the Explore screen on here, uh, just a little ways down on the far right is Alerts. So right down here is the alert section. So I'm going to click on that. And what we can see is my account alerts. So these are alerts that I have already configured that I am getting. So you can see I have an interest in metro counties on an hourly basis. So if I'm like really raring to go, if it's rare and it shows up in one of the five metro counties that I can get to pretty quickly, I want to know about it every hour on the hour. Now these alerts are coming into you via email. So of course, it does depend if you have that kind of an interest, you do have to check your email regularly or have alerts on your phone, whatever it might be. I don't do that a ton, but it is something I want available to me if I'm out bird watching. I can check the hourly alerts that might be coming in. And I've got a Minnesota Daily, and that's a year needs alert. So that's a lot different. That's not rarities or what we're talking about in that space. You can configure these for yourself uh, right down below. And the, the excellent thing is, is you can get a look at them first, 
before you then subscribe to them. Now, if there's nothing in a particular county or state that's rare at the current moment, uh, within I think it's seven days, it'll just be a blank response. You know, it doesn't send anything if there's nothing to send. Um, so let's let's do a county in here, and I do happen to know that there was a rare bird in Dakota County, and let's do a view on that particular one. So this is what it'll look like. We can see California Gull was. Uh, reported here at 140th Street Marsh, and these are all the individuals that have reported a particular rare bird. We can also see a glaucus gull in here, and then we can see some subspecies variety uh, birds. Red-tailed hawk as a Harlan's hawk, uh, Oregon-type dark-eyed juncos. Um, so that's what you know. one of these might look like in here. Additionally, you can put these at a higher level, so if we go to Minnesota, we can view that one as well. And this is going to give a, a broader view of the state at a given time. Now, there are some points within the year that the number of rare birds reported, the number of reports of those individuals can be very daunting. So this list might be exceedingly long, just depends on the time of the year. So what's going on right now? That's, you know, sort of an interest in, you know, the, the whole uh, deal. So I want to punch in Becker right now. About a week or so ago, uh, I believe Mark Otnes uh, was the first individual to report a uh, female mountain bluebird up in Detroit Lakes uh, in Becker County. Uh, excellent bird, uh, a nice relatively early record, March 23rd, I believe was that first report uh, of it. And this is where, you know, kind of information becomes important. You can see some reports on the page where the reports were done from a nearby hotspot. Uh, and it was listed on Dunton Locks County Park uh, because there was a hotspot nearby for that and it's actually connected to the location. So I've clicked on this map and I've opened up uh, a Google map and it shows Dunton Locks Park and there's actually a road through here and trail that goes under the highway and pops all the way over to here. This is Voyager Lanes uh, up on the uh, top side of this uh, map here, which is a bowling alley, and the actual bird was reported in this area. So it's something to be aware of that uh, when data comes up, once you get more and more sightings of it, it can give you a, a better idea of where the bird actually was located. If you didn't get that information directly, say, from a Facebook group that might have specific coordinates, it, it pays to uh, take a look at some of these things. Because when we get a spot more like this, this is probably a personal location spot, which is more likely to be uh, close to where it is. And there you can see it. This particular set of GPS coordinates pings in uh, right at this location, right at this uh, water cross through uh, into the lake, and we get a little bit broader view out here of what this looks like. And if we maybe pop back right to here, there you can see Dunton Locks uh, County Park. So it is nearby, but it's not necessarily exactly where that bird was located. So something to be aware of. Really cool bird, uh, really great find uh, uh, early in the season uh, on it. Now I want to jump into something that's kind of interesting. This, I, I think, is where some broader conversation can occur uh, on things. About a week and a half or so ago, uh, a friend of mine, Brad Abendroth, found in Scott County a glaucus skull. Uh, glaucus skull does flag rare. He knew that it was a really good bird. Uh, he lives in Scott County, knows that county exceedingly well, so he bubbled that up uh, on some online Facebook group resources. And when he did that, a number of people started to uh, track that bird down, started to come out for it. And if I go into, nope, not mine, let's go into this. We're going to go into species maps. And inside of species maps, uh, we just want the current year. We don't want uh, too broad of uh, detail in here. So current year, and then we're going to do Glaucus. Glaucus go. Pop that up. It's going to show us the worldwide view. But we are going to quickly zoom in 
and we're going to show points sooner. So there's an option on the right hand side around the middle to show points sooner so that it's less of the purple blobs and more of the exact specifics. And then we'll go down into the southwest metro for Glockaskull and we can find those right down here. So this was on some uh, uh, Shakopee, uh, Meditowoc, and Sioux uh, off-reservation trust land. Uh, there's a drive-through uh, road through this property and there's usually some standing water in the spring especially uh, around this location. So Glockaskull was found by Brad. He put the word out and people started coming out and I could just click on uh, you know random uh, lists in here and so we can see this particular list we can get a look at uh, Glockaskull and oh it does say that this was found by Bob Williams so uh, that's uh, perhaps a mistake on my part I didn't necessarily know I thought it, Brad had found it but uh, I know Brad to be a solid birder in the area but Do Bob Williams is uh, an excellent county lister as well and it looks like he possibly is the uh, original finder of that bird so this is where it gets interesting I think Glaucus gull found in Scott County, the word goes out and individuals start coming in for it and the, the Patagonia effect kicks in. So if you haven't heard of that Patagonia picnic table effect, it's named after a rest stop area, uh, Patagonia, Arizona, and one bird gets reported, a rarity of some sort, and then other people show up and the more people that show up, the greater the opportunity is to detect other things that might be happening in that location. And sure enough, uh, Matthew Thompson, a uh, young high school birder from Dakota County found a California gull, an adult California gull, and in fact got a photograph of it. Uh, happened to know that he used a Nikon P900 Super Zoom camera and got a photograph of the bird, and unfortunately no one else got the bird. But the story doesn't end there, and that's where this is kind of fun uh, in this, is the extreme unlikeliness of it occurring, but it's uh, quite exciting. So as we talk about rare birds, I want to pop back to another situation that then links to this uh, a, a few days later. And, and I mean a few, it's only about a half a week uh, at the most. So I'm going to zoom out uh, of this and I'm going to do California. all right here all right I gotta zoom out and you will notice that currently there are two locations that have California gull Matthew Thompson's uh, first report on 315 and then a string of uh, items again with Matthew Thompson and his dad on 323 so just a number of days later Matthew Thompson either refines the same adult bird or a different one, but either way, nobody finds two California gulls in a week in Minnesota. That's just not a thing. Maybe you find, maybe there's been a report of two of them in one location at some point on the extreme western edge of the state. This is not a common bird for the area. Uh, and we can actually validate that with this tool set. If we do, uh, instead of year round current year, let's do the past 10 years for California gull stay in this location. This is the last 10 years. So two reports and now it's five reports. That's it. In the last 10 years, those have been the reports for California gulls in the metro area. So being able to get one in two different counties in about a week, that's fairly amazing. But that's not necessarily where the story for the 140th Street Marsh in Dakota County starts. Where it starts is another birder friend of mine, Larry Servio, driving to the 140th Street area and seeing a number of gulls there, and we will zoom into this location a bit tighter now. And as he drives by this well-known property, there is, you can see this SKB Environmental. This is a landfill. And if you know gulls, you know that gulls love landfills. Uh, especially on migration, they find it as a uh, food source, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on the circumstances. And Larry drives by and sees that there are a number of gulls up on the hillside, and he only has his binoculars with him. 
he notifies another friend of mine, uh, Dr. Peter Nichols, and says, hey, there's a lot of gulls out here, but I don't have a scope with me. Uh, Pete's not in an immediate position to go out and check for this bird, so he puts a notice out on Facebook in a group and says, there's a lot of gulls at 140th Street Marsh, somebody should go out and check them. This is where Matthew Thompson comes in. Matthew says, I can go check it. He comes out with his dad, they only live a few miles down the road, and start scoping the gulls, and lo and behold, there's a California gull. So I guess kind of the, the whole point of that story in the sidebar is that both of these California gull sightings are the result of other information. A glaucus gull on the trust land in Scott County was an original find, but then the California gull was a subsequent find. It was a Patagonia uh, bird, if you will. And then in this particular case, it was just, here's a group of good birds, it's migration, this is probably a great opportunity to do, uh, for somebody to get on that uh, and find those individuals, and then we have this downstream impact from it. So just a kind of a fun, you know, interesting story and idea around all of this stuff, and then how, you know, some of this about how you find this stuff inside of eBird, how you track these particular things down, and uh, you know, utilize just this tool set inside the Explorer. So uh, going back to the beginning here, you can do an Explorer, hit on the species maps, and then you just modify your drop downs and other details around it. So just going through that again, you know, year round, current year, that sets it for here, and then you pop a bird in there. So let's do California. Ooh, gotta type it right. Yeah, California gull. And then you get this kind of worldwide view uh, of things and you hit the show point sooner, which I have a preference for because as we zoom in tighter, then we get these a little bit quicker than we might otherwise. And then you can start uh, reviewing those and uh, looking at the bits and pieces and details uh, in them. So that's pretty much all I want to talk about on this particular segment. But what we're going to do next is we're going to jump into migration and kind of giving yourself an idea of where the birds are at and when they might arrive and using historical data to do that and this semi real-time data that comes out of uh, eBird on it. So, Alright, so now we, we've jumped through rare birds and I want to jump into general migration detail. So just an idea I had around a Facebook post that I saw. And the Facebook post was very innocent and it was very inquisitive. And the, the question was quite simple. When should I put out my jelly for the Baltimore Orioles? And that got me thinking about uh, ruby-throated hummingbirds as well. And I see these questions on an annual basis. And certainly feeder watchers aren't necessarily going to be digging into details and whatever. And a lot of times they'll know that there's a whole community of birders that are happy to provide information about when might be an appropriate time window to do so and not do so and stuff. But it gave me an idea to, to look in a segment here a little bit deeper at some of the resources available to us that help individuals that are the ones that answer these questions about when do you start looking for something? Or when do you think about looking at the fringes of when it's there to see if you can find an early report or something of that sort? So I'm gonna jump back into my browser. We're gonna go right back into the eBird website. And so I'm interested in Baltimore Orioles. And we wanna look at real time, where are the Baltimore Orioles? So inside of the species pages we could do that uh, but let's go into species maps right below it on the left side species maps we were just in here and instead of year round all years we're going to go to current year so the one thing that we know about baltimore orioles is, is they're not here yet it's late march there may be overwintering birds which are very few and far between but if you've done a little bit of research or you know some of their background, Baltimore Orioles are generally neotropical migrants. So they're in South and Central America uh, until they begin the migration north. And whether or not they've begun that uh, or whatever, we're going to find out. So let's look at Baltimore Oriole. Click on that. This will give us the worldwide population. Generally, it's a uh, 
uh, over here in the Western Hemisphere. But the frequency uh, on the color graph and, and details, what it shows us is there are overwintering individuals or individuals present on the East Coast and the Southern part of the United States, but there's a large density of them in Central America. So as we kind of refocus this and move this to the Midwest, we can also click show points sooner. And we have a couple of odd reports out here in the Midwest. We can see this is from January and these are from January. So those are overwintering birds. Who knows if they survive the winter or not. It's a really tough uh, survival rate for a neotropical migrant bird. Uh, but Orioles have done stranger things. But generally speaking, you can see that they did not hang around in Minnesota. They are not in Minnesota. They are not in Iowa. They're not in Illinois, they're not in Missouri, and they might just maybe right now today, uh, as I do this on March 29th, be in Arkansas, Tennessee, and below. Uh, so these are just some individual birds. We're not talking about the bulk of them coming into the country yet. So if you look at real-time data, this kind of a map set to year-round current year can tell you when a particular species uh, is coming in. The one thing that this lacks, though, is specific context of when can you actually expect the bulk of them to show up in Minnesota. There's actually a couple of different ways we can do this, and the first way that I want to do it is with eBirds. So let's go back to Explore. We'll just click on Explore. And now we're going to jump into Bar Charts. So in this same more ways to explore section, we just did species maps, but diagonally from that in this group of four is bar charts. I'm gonna click on that. All right, now inside of bar charts, we need to say what region are we interested in? So in this case, we are interested in Minnesota. So this is a state-based list. We're gonna click Minnesota, and then we can choose uh, select a sub-region. So if I wanna know uh, a specific county area or whatever, but I'm just going to do the entire region, the entirety of Minnesota, I want to know uh, what it is. Now you can do some other stuff about specific locations, and that's getting exceedingly granular, because what we want to know is when do they show up in the state generally? Like when should I put my jelly out? When should I start looking for them if I'm a birder? Whatever it might be. I'm going to click continue. And now we've got some birds in here, and I need to do a quick search. Baltimore and here we get a little bit of a data feed now this kind of gives us some general idea but let's get this tighter so I'm gonna click on the little uh, icon uh, in there and now I'm in uh, bird observations and actually that may have happened relatively quickly so I'm actually gonna go back to this real quick get back on Baltimore All right, so we've got the name, and then there's a little uh, hotspot icon to the right, and then one more to the right is a line graph uh, icon, and then we've got this actual histogram uh, with the green bars on it that show the relative abundance, and we can see it starting to just edge in in the end of April, and then it really picks up in May uh, on it. But let's click on this second icon after the bird's name. And that's this screen that we were just on. So we can, again, we can see the histogram and then we can begin to get data. So we've got a frequency chart in here and this does an exceedingly good job of telling you what you need to know if that is a question that you just asked. And if you look down uh, on this blue, it's kind of a flat line across the bottom until we get to the last week of April into the first week of May, and it is an extremely steep uh, incline. So this is telling you that the bulk majority of birds come in at a very timely location. Now this is going to be weather dependent, it's going to be the conditions, but generally speaking it's like they're not here one day and then boom there's Baltimore Orioles almost everywhere. So as for the question when should I put out my uh, bird feeders, when should I put out jelly? The answer is probably the last week of April, maybe the first week of May. Now, that's a kind of a general question, a general ask. This is where some MOU, again, Minnesota Ornithologist Union data, can provide some really interesting granular 
uh, viewpoint. So I'm going to pop over to the MOU website uh, in here and we're going to go to the species pages and I've already got it open on the next tab but I want you to know how to get to this information because I love these pages. Dave Callender uh, is the web uh, admin for the MOU's website. He does some work uh, on this that's quite amazing. Let's take a look at review reported birds. So on the left hand side uh, below the Salt Lake Birding Weekend, we're about, what, four down there. So we're going to click on Review Reported Birds. And some options come up here. And the third one is General Species Information. So, yes, there is general information, but I find it to be a lot deeper than just general. So I'm going to click over to the tab because it does take a moment or two to load. And you have to then uh, track down the specific birds you're interested in. So these species pages are uh, graphics rich as you can see and are absolutely phenomenal. I love them. You can see that in winter of course the Baltimore Oriole is almost non-existent but we do get some winter records you know individual birds that have been unable to make the transit. But what I want to focus on in this particular uh, discussion is the seasonal occurrence in Minnesota. So I'm just going to zoom that to the point that it's most of the screen. And what we get in here is a little bit of extra value, south and north. So the red line is birds in the south, and the blue line is birds in the north. So if you loosely divided the state in half into a northern half and a southern half, this information just gives you a little bit better view of how many birds and when are they coming in in the south. And so you can see these two differences uh, in this. And what they tell you is there's a lot less Baltimore Orioles in the northern part of the state. And that makes sense because some of that is boreal forest up there and bog. And that's not Baltimore Oriole habitat. Baltimore Orioles are more hardwood forest birds. So when we see this south line, this gives us roughly a very similar vibe, but there is a little bit of an indication that it takes a little while for them to get up to the north when they are in the north. So you can more likely expect them to start picking up later in the first week of May, as opposed to already picking up at the beginning of the first week of May. So it's only a seven day difference, but it is something that's interesting. You can see it in the data. This is an aggregate of all the MOU data that's occurred over many, many decades, and it's being distilled into this map. So you can see they get here, they spike in number, they disperse out to breeding habitats, and then through June, July, and August, this main breeding period, you can see the numbers reduce. And, and they just they start to come down along the way because as these birds uh, finish out their breeding cycle, they can be a lot quieter. They're you know trying to feed their young. And then we can see by the time we get into mid-September, they are almost gone. So obviously seeing anything in the winter months, seeing anything in late fall, November, December, January, we're talking a nearly non-existent data set uh, for that bird. So that Baltimore Royal has a very clean profile in the state. So the next time you ask yourself, when do the Baltimore Orioles get here? You can use two different resources for that. The MOU uh, general species information pages, or inside you will see very similar information in eBird uh, presented to you as well. One thing I learned when I uh, just started doing this and kind of rehearsing to record this segment was you can actually overlay more than one bird, more than one species in here. This was really cool. So if I do a change species up here, right under the title bird observations, click on species and it's already got Baltimore still in there. But what if I wanted to do Ruby throated hummingbird? Now it's gonna put two of them in there. Aha. Uh -huh. So if we look at the histogram first, we can see they have a very similar profile. We can see that the ruby-throated hummingbird also just barely pegs late April, and then it really starts to increase through May, and then both of the birds begin trailing off just slightly differently. It seems ruby-throated hummingbirds have a little bit longer window of opportunity. It might take them a little longer uh, to continue or to finish feeding their young to get strong enough so it's time to move south and Baltimore Orioles certainly would be a stronger flyer at least or a, a larger hardier bird so you just see a slightly different life cycle on the the back end towards fall but let's take a look at these two overlapped with one another 
and we can get a really good vibe that that is in fact what we're seeing. We can see that last week of April, first week of May, these birds spike fairly heavily uh, in frequency. And then we also see another large spike uh, actually in ruby-throated hummingbird in the fall months, uh, much different than the way that we do with Baltimore Oriole. And part of that is because ruby-throated hummingbirds have a, a slightly broader range across the state, so there's going to be more birds in the north, so there's going to be more birds to come back. So their reporting frequency will be disproportionately higher uh, in those return numbers because once the Baltimore Orioles leave the area, they're not necessarily being replaced by tons of birds coming in from the north either. So just kind of an interesting thing that you can see inside the data. There's all kinds of extra tabs in here uh, to jump into. You can look at average count. I just want to pop that one up real quick. That just gives you an idea of you know how many on average are being reported when they are being reported. You can click on uh, totals in here. This gives you a really interesting view when we look at totals. And this can be really crazy when you look at a bird you know to be exceedingly common, say like Canada geese or American robin. And you can see when we peak uh, on average in those first few couple of weeks of May, you get up into the 18,000 plus reports. Now, ruby-throated hummingbird doesn't flock together. They're not as loud, definitely. They're a little bit harder to track down and find because they have very specific requirements and their populations are likely different. So these peak reported numbers are around that six to 8,000 range for ruby-throated hummingbirds. So you can see a comparison between species that I didn't realize you could get a really good visual on. When you're trying to figure out when birds are arriving, when are they leaving, you could do this with dark-eyed junco and be like, oh, when are the juncos leaving us for the uh, summer and you know heading back north? You can get a good idea and a good view of that stuff. So just something I thought would be fun. All right, so we're back for the third and final segment of this first episode. And what I was thinking might be good to do is to give some ideas on what to do during uh, COVID-19. You know, while we're sheltered in place, while we're social distancing, what are some things individuals can do uh, that you can dig into, maybe distract yourself a bit, but uh, something that can be fun, can be enjoyable. The first thing that came to my mind was to talk about yard listing. So just the entire idea of I'm gonna work on my yard list, or maybe I'm gonna start a new yard list, or maybe I'm just worried about this year's yard list. And one of the reasons I feel like I can be somebody that talks about this is, is I do not have what birders would consider a premium yard space. In fact, three years ago, when my wife and I moved into our current home in Lake Elmo, Minnesota, which is in the uh, East Metro, very East Metro, just off of Highway 94, so within a half mile north of Highway 94 in Lake Elmo, we bought a home. This used to be a cornfield, so I'm not talking about an extreme habitat nearby, amazing property, nothing of the sort. We are talking about it's a standard yard, it is community maintained, uh, so it's mowed lawn, one of the biggest benefits we do have is directly to the south of us across the street is kind of an empty lot. There's a, a stretch of land there that will probably de be developed in some way, shape, or form. Commercial, residential, we're not 100% certain, but it isn't right now. So utilizing that yard space and the sky above us, I've kind of made it a goal, find as many birds as I can. And in 2019, we found a lot of really good birds in the yard. And I'm gonna go through some of those and then I'm gonna go through one of the tools inside of eBird that you can use to manage your yard list in a much easier fashion. So let's talk about some of these. There's some fun stories in here. During 2019, I was on a, a bit of a quest statewide in Minnesota to find as many birds as humanly possible. I drove to all 87 counties, covered tens of thousands of miles during the year, and saw a lot of birds. So I reached that, I had 10,000 county ticks, which means, you know, I 
covered. I had a crow in all 87 counties, so that was 87 ticks. And then you just add that up over all the species in all the counties, and all of those lists together was over 10,000 uh, for it. But some of the most amazing moments actually happened at home. So early in the year, I'm making these runs. I'm heading out to, to go birding on the weekends after work whenever I can. And I go out on the 20th of January uh, to head out of town on the weekend. Uh, it's daylight hours already. And I hear a ruckus. And that ruckus is crows. And they seem to be exceedingly interested in another bird. Now, at eyesight distance without a camera... Uh, binoculars were already uh, slung over my shoulder. It looked like maybe a red-tailed hawk, and I thought it was kind of odd because usually the crows don't get all that wound up about a, a red-tailed hawk. Now, certainly they will, but I was surprised, and I looked, and they were really active, and the bird that was moving didn't move normally uh, for me. So we pop over to this next one. A lot of you may get this bird uh, immediately with this photograph. It was a long-eared owl in daylight hours flying literally above my neighborhood. There's a, a large stand of pines along the eastern edge of our neighborhood that separates from an older neighborhood uh, on it. So it's a very thin corridor, and I mean very thin, only probably 75 to 100 feet wide and about a half mile long, though. So it goes from 5th Street all the way to 10th Street. I don't know if that's where the bird came out of. Somehow the crows uh, scared this poor owl up, and it was circling, trying to get some elevation. A little bit of an out-of-focus shot here. This was probably the best one I got, even though it was still out of focus. Uh, my camera's not really set up for this stuff, but to have a long-eared owl fly over your house, it actually was the only long-eared owl I got on the year, because I wasn't chasing birds. I was trying to get as many as possible in all different counties, and it just so happened the only one I got after driving tens of thousands of miles in the year was a long-eared owl from my own driveway, just by paying attention to the birds around me and what's going on. Now, this bird. I had finished birding for the day and was actually writing an article on uh, February 9th, the weather was really terrible. If anybody remembers last year in February, it was absolutely brutal. It was our snowiest February. Uh, it was the fourth or third snowiest single month in Minnesota state history. So it was an absolute beast. I was sitting at the kitchen table facing outdoors. So I, I literally sit at the kitchen table to write on a laptop and I face myself so I can see the outdoors just in case. And Flying into view was this rough-legged hawk, light morph bird. I had my camera and my binoculars on the table with me. That's another note about yard birding, that if you want to take it to the extreme, you have to have your optics with you at all times. <laughs> Not too hard when you're at home, but I work from home uh, when the opportunity arises. So I have a room on the house that faces the south, so I get the best view of the yard and sky that I can give me opportunities for a bird like this. This particular bird was soaring over the property, and it was visible and gone within 45 seconds. So my ability to get a photograph on that bird and identify it was an extremely small window of opportunity, but that can be the fun of yard birding sometimes, is to have these opportunities. This one is really exciting. On March 15th, we had just come through that absolutely brutal February. March hadn't gotten off to a great start either, but it was starting to show signs that spring was actually gonna come. And I'm working from home and I take a quick pause, look out my window to the south and I see a, a line of geese approaching. And when I put my binoculars on it, I immediately saw a flash of white. And you can see it on screen up towards the front. When I zoom into this, what we can also see right in front of them is an exceedingly small goose that looks like a Canada goose. So that one there up at the front, that looks like a uh, cackling goose to me, which means at a relatively identical size and considering the bill profile shown in this picture, is a Ross's goose trailing him. If we go back in this chain a little bit, right back to here underneath, we can see another cackling goose uh, in that. A little bit of a tweener bird in between there, but 
two cackling geese and a Ross's goose added to my yard list. I certainly saw quite a number of cackling geese and Ross's geese, but I believe these were the only ones in Washington County last year that I saw. And in fact, that Ross's goose was the first one we reported in the entire state of Minnesota last year. And I saw it from my yard while I was at work. Definitely a really cool bird that I'll never forget. Now these two, we got all the way through March, spring started to show up, and then in April on the 10th, the day started out nicely. The backyard was a little bit uh, moist. We actually have a drainage ditch and it started snowing. And as soon as it started snowing, these two Wilson snipe showed up out of nowhere and started probing the yard in this drain zone looking for something to eat and it continued to snow and they continued to hang out uh, on it and at one point just kind of sat down and hung out you can see snow on his bill uh, as he was getting in there now I want to again clarify I don't have anything in my yard. This is a relatively new yard. We haven't done a whole lot of plantings. The berm itself, that is an elevated section to kind of separate from the road, has some trees scattered on it, but they're very small, they're very new. They've only been put in a few years ago, and we literally have no other trees in our yard itself, and we were still able to get a Wilson snipe. In fact, a pair of them uh, come into the yard. And that isn't where it ended either. On the 22nd, I saw a large group of blackbirds in this empty lot I referenced uh, before. I was, again, working, looked out my window and saw this large gr group of blackbirds flying around. And I was like, well, you never know if you don't try. So I started uh, with my binoculars on them and I saw a couple of wing flashes. You can actually see the white flashing on the uh, primary feathers on this yellow-headed blackbird. I saw it in flight, saw it pop down, went and grabbed my camera, and then I ran across the street uh, only a couple, maybe a hundred yards away from uh, where I'm standing right now. And in fact, there was this bird and one other. So I was able to get two yellow-headed blackbirds in the middle of Lake Elmo, just a half mile north of the highway, in habitat that is not all that exciting, and was able to get this yellow-headed blackbird picture. Uh, absolutely cool stuff, really fun. Uh, and just uh, a few items I wanted to share about. All these birds were 2019 birds. This isn't the entire three year history uh, for us out there. Now, how do you do this for yourself? How do you track your own yard species list? So obviously I just talked about, you can get all kinds of cool birds, even if your yard isn't super cool. It just takes paying attention, having your optics available to you, and really thinking about birds as they come through and doing sky watches, especially in the spring. This time of year right now, I was literally just outside yesterday morning and I watched a group of about 29 tundra swans fly over, hooting, you know, uh, softly, you know, with their calls as they uh, flew by. It was relatively quiet out. There wasn't a whole lot of highway noise and was able to see tundra swans fly over. That's how people get a lot of these flyover uh, goose species and swans and stuff is just hanging out in your yard and waiting for something to fly over. We're back on the explore page again on eBird. And if you scroll down this list, there is a compare your total section. So these are like the uh, kind of soft competitive things where you can get on the top 100 list for a given state or region or whatever it might be. But then there's also two sections, yard totals and patch totals. And we just want to talk about yard totals. So this is your yard and they'll provide you comparison opportunities down below. If we scroll down here, you can see in the United States for the given month, they'll have the month leaders and things of that sort or whatever. And you know, this is all friendly competition. It's not uh, you know, it's not really a fair competition. You know, when you consider, say, like my yard compared to somebody that might live on a national wildlife refuge adjacent, it's going to be a very different experience. But this is, you can click a button and you can click add a yard. And then inside of that, if you have birded in your yard and named that list, you know, you'd probably be, you know, uh, something like, you know, for me, it'd be like Lake Alma Home or whatever. So actually, I can do that. So Lake Alma Home. Uh, Douglas is the name of this particular yard, but if I do an edit on that, you can see on the right that I've selected Lake Elmo Home. So that's what I've named my personal spot. You can search for it in the list. Once you get that, you can do a save. 
uh, yard, and now it's created that. So every time you eBird from that personal spot, Lake Elmo Home, it shows up in this list and it will track it month, year over year, lifetime, all of that stuff gets tracked inside of this section. So just zooming in uh, to focus here, I've got that. Now prior to that in Minnesota from 2012 to 2016 I lived in Oakdale just a few miles west of here so I had a yard list for that one and now it has no more year or month to it. It just has a lifetime total because obviously I don't live there anymore but it's nice to have it as a reference point. And then I was also able to create an all yards lived list. So if you do happen to move you could do something fun like edit this and you could put your previous home locations in it. Now I've kind of juiced this one a little bit. I've got actually my Inwood neighborhood, which is where my current home is located. So there are some trails really nearby to the house. I include them in this particular list in here, though it depends on your, you know, purity desires for, you know, what you want in your own list uh, on this. But again, this is a great way that you can track your yard list. You can just click on lifetime total and it'll give you all your first ever finds for a given location. Let's see, we'll uh, yep, it was 2016, so it was already sorted based on the date on there. So you can see the first bird or first list I ever put in for my new yard was uh, kill deer uh, and song sparrow. In fact, these came in before I ever actually even moved into the house. I didn't move in until October of 2016, but as we visited the property, I started doing lists, whatever we would visit on that, so I could get a little head start on my yard list uh, on it. But uh, just a, a fun way to, you know, Break the monotony, the tedium is as we get these migrant waves starting to come in, uh, try and find them in your own, own yard. Now certainly there's some things you just won't get, but you know, again, I would emphasize if I can find a Wilson snipe in my backyard in suburbia, you can find just about anything. I've had a uh, flyover black crowned night heron uh, from my yard. I have red-headed woodpecker on migration uh, flying through the area. All kinds of really cool stuff. I have snow buntings. Uh, Dick Sissel were on territory. In fact, that weedy lot that I referenced across the street has hosted bobolinks before and eastern meadowlarks. It's a really funky kind of a spot just barely off the highway and something fun to do uh, during these times. So thank you for your time. Appreciate you tuning in. And uh, if you like what you hear and you're interested in more, certainly uh, comment on the video.